Ah, we're alive. Away we go. And welcome to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm the host of Football Network World's weekly online discussion with football practitioners around the world. And um, today I'm joined by two wonderful women's football coaches, Anne Helene Graham and Ali Speechley. Um, before I introduce you fully to them, I'll just sort of run through today's agenda so that you can filter through your questions to Anne Helene and Ali on the topic of approaches to engaging and empowering individual development in women's youth football with a focus on the under 14 to under 16 age group. Uh, once we get through the uh, introductions, um, the main focus for the first half of the discussion will be around participation and particularly sort of dealing with the large number of um, dropouts in girls sport in general, which football is not, is not alone in. Um, around that age group of 14 to 16, some of the reasons for that, what are some of the areas where it's possible to combat that, are there some areas where it's just such a social thing and you know you just have to accept that's just the natural way of things. Um, on the back of that then we'll look at that sort of engaging players and getting that balance right between sort of creating elite pathways and encouraging the lifelong involvement in football and then on the back of that elite level sort of yeah how we're empowering uh, girls through football and specifically then looking at developing the individual development plans alongside that so that we can get through to all that then let me uh, introduce you to our guest today uh, we'll begin with um, Ali Speechley um, former Spurs and Mill Lionesses football coach. Um, Ali, um, tell us a little bit about your, your pathway into football and, and coaching. Sure, thanks Steve. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Um, so I started coaching in 2014, which in the grand scheme of things doesn't feel like that long ago. Um, I started gr coaching grassroots football for girls aged 5 to 11. Um, and then I progressed on to Millwall Lionesses, where I coached in their regional talent club, which is their academy set up. Um, and then moved on to Tottenham Hotspur, as Steve mentioned, where I coached um, under 13s, under 14s, and then moved into under 15s with the girls there. Before I moved in across over to their community um, programme with Tottenham Hotspur Foundation. Um, where I coached a whole range of age groups, but that also included uh, college girls and boys um, around 17 years old. Uh, I've also coached a, a, a summer camp in Spain and I've done a little bit of one-to-one -one sort of private coaching as well. So yeah, I've done a, I've done a few things uh, in that space of time since I started coaching. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Ali. And Anne-Helene Graham, um, former Sweden and Scotland women's national team assistant coach. How are you today, Anne-Helene? I'm very well, thank you, Steve. Uh, thanks for having me, and um, and good morning or good day, everyone, or good evening, wherever you might be. Uh, I'm sitting in my office in in Malmo, in the southern parts of Sweden. Uh, sometimes call it the tropics, but then I'm just making a joke. Um, anyway, as, as Steve said, I'm. Um, uh, I've uh, worked for a number of years with uh, with the national teams, but uh, uh, but I've done uh, loads of other things as, as well. And uh, and I really I really go back in time when I hear your introduction, Ali. Uh, uh, and I wish I was there again because it's uh, you've got so much uh, in front of you, and uh, we we all do because it's uh, it's fantastic times for for women's football. Um, I started in started playing at the age of nine, where it was still then in the beginning of the 80s in Sweden. It wasn't for every girl to to play football, so so most clubs started started getting activities and teams for girls, and uh, and it became a very big part of my life. Uh, and um, and I also found uh, found out that it would be quite fascinating to start coaching so I took my first coaching badge at the age of 14 and and from then um, 
continued coaching uh, as well as playing. Played until I was 27. Uh, was never any any high uh, high star of any sort. Uh, just Division One. I, I normally say at the highest. Um, but I've coached from the age of 14, and uh, and uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, both uh, with Sweden and uh, and Scotland. Uh, I call myself an adopted Scot uh, from having lived there for 11 years, uh, working with uh, both youth uh, on the girls' side and and women's football, um, but also tried to to do a lot before that in terms of being a club coach, uh, uh, etc. And had the opportunity to to experience some some um, championship tournaments, uh, which has been great. But um, but I think the highlights has been uh, working with youth, which is what I do today again. So I'm a player development manager for um, the most southern district in Sweden, in Skåne, uh, where I work with that, organizing and overseeing the programs on the boys and the girls side between the age of 14 to 17. So that's me. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Thanks, Anne Helene. Um, before we get into yeah the roles that you're sort of both working around now, and when the death, if I could both take you back in time to when you were at that age group that we're going to discuss today, that sort of fourteen to sixteen age group, and so I noticed then Anne Helene, you mentioning that not only were you playing, that you already began looking into coaching at, at that age, but as a fourteen-year-old in Sweden with this love of football. Um, what were the obstacles for you once you're reaching that sort of 14, 15, 16, where you are a woman, a young girl maturing into a, into a, young, a young woman? Um, and, and what sort of encouraged you that, to able to get over those obstacles and, and sort of have this lifelong involvement within, within women's football? Mm. I think the, uh, the the challenges that that I faced, uh, trying to to go back in in time and, and thinking what, what what was it really? Because uh, you luckily you you pick out the good bits and that's what you remember further down the down the line. But of course, uh, um, where I grew up in a in a small town, it was um, uh, back then in the 80s. It was it was very much still a boy sport. I would say that it's changed a lot. Um, um until today obviously uh, but at that point it was we got worse training times um it was always a, a discussion you know if there was a, enough coaches for different teams and and who was going to be getting the different resources and uh, being a little bit questioned uh for for being uh, a girl and and not maybe taken as seriously as as uh as I would have liked at the time, um, so that was probably you know putting everything into a more like a bigger, bigger uh, picture. But but I think what um, what really helped me was that I was I was lucky from a from an early age to have role models around me, so uh, older coaches that that saw that I was uh, had a big interest. So uh, so they helped me, they guided me, they. They took uh, took care of the what do you say the, the difficult things that was as a young coach, uh, but I think I, I maybe I grew as a as a player through through being a coach, uh, becoming a coach early as well. That uh, that made me develop that strong love for the game, uh, and that probably wouldn't have happened without those role models that was around in in the club, uh, older coaches. That had other teams that helped me with everything. So it was it was never called a mentor, but it was it was definitely uh, three or four characters that was becoming my mentors at that time. Okay, we'll sort of come back to that sort of mm -hmm. yeah that sort of topic around around mentors. Um, we'll sort of throw it over to to Ali and uh, yeah your your recollections of sort of coming through that sort of difficult teenage years and sort of what was the footballing landscape for you at that time? Yeah, so it's an interesting one for me because football is my first love. So I, I've loved football 
pretty much from the moment I could walk. Um, and I played it every day in primary school at lunchtime, but I wasn't allowed to play for the school team because I was a girl. And when I went to secondary school, I went to an all girls school and there wasn't any football provision. Um, so I turned to hockey and um, hockey became my passion. So actually at 14, I was captaining my school hockey team, but I wasn't playing football at all. Um, we did try to start a football club, like an after school club at school, uh, but there was never any opposition for us to play. So it kind of just fizzled out. Um, so it's quite an interesting one for me in that I draw upon um, a history of feeling quite left out from this sport that I love. Um, and, one, and that's what kind of impassions me and powers me on today is to create those spaces, um, particularly for teenage girls and, and younger girls to know that they can have a space in this game. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's quite a different history to Anne Helen, but, um, but yeah, I, I have always loved the sport. And I think one of the reasons I started coaching, because I did, I did take it up, I didn't start playing organised football until I was 30, uh, which, which felt too late in many respects, but I did it anyway. And I, I, I played for about three seasons and then I stopped uh, so that I could have more time for coaching. But I think coaching has definitely helped um, give me a space in the game and help give other females space in the game. I mean, I'm um, sure whether at the age of 14, where, whereabouts were you, were you living at that time? Um, me? I was, I was in uh, South East London. So I was in London in England. Um, and this was, so I started secondary school in 1994. So this would have been, you know, throughout the, the mid to late 90s. Um, and there was, the thing is, so Millwall Lionesses, for example, has been around for a very long time. Um, so those clubs did exist. Um, it was about kind of knowing that they existed and having pathways into clubs like that. And um, if you didn't have that talent, there was a gap in terms of grassroots provision for girls to play football. Okay, it seems a gap that, that was being filled in, in Sweden uh, at, for those age groups, by the sounds of it, um, and Helene. Um, yes, I think um, it's, it's been, uh, even though I say, said it was uh, feeling a little bit of a second priority um, already, well, back then at that time, it's, it has been, uh, I think the difference, I've, I've lived a long time, as I said, in, in, in the UK as well. And, um, and I think one, one big difference for me when I moved to, to Scotland back in 2005, it was, um, uh, was that uh, in Sweden there's a, a club structure, uh, the infrastructure of clubs uh, offering opportunities at various level is, is very catered for. Um, so, so that there isn't like, uh, there's, there's be levels between what we talk about as elite and being, well, be really grassroots. It's like a pyramid. And uh, so it can cater for, uh, for so many individuals. But of course, then you have rural, rural sorry, too many R's there, uh, areas uh, uh, which have difficulties and, and, uh, and must look at how can we really uh, make sure that that we are a club, we are a society that, that caters for uh, everyone. Um, and I think now the past, I don't know for how many years, uh, this, the Swedish FA has had a big slogan that says, you know, um, well, everyone's different, but difference is good. And we need, uh, football needs everyone um, and, and must also uh, offer, offer opportunities for everyone. So, um, but it's, it's still, it's like Ali says, um, there might be opportunities, but if these opportunities clubs, uh, different environments doesn't uh, market themselves uh, towards schools or areas where the, the kids are, then, then they don't find their way there. They, they don't find their way to the right, uh, to what's right for them, for, for each individual. So that's, that's an important thing for football as a whole, club, districts, um, everything. Yeah. I mean, sort of Ali, yeah, sort of move, bringing it forward then to where we are today. Um, are you seeing that there are being these bigger changes then in terms of accessibility and visibility of, 
opportunities for for women to play, whether it be with you know, one of the Super League or Championship clubs, or or just like at a group grassroots level. Yeah, definitely. I think we've come a long, long way, and um, you know, in this country, obviously, the FA had their game plan for growth, which has been really successful um, for kind of championing women's football in this country really and developing it from grassroots and um, school playgrounds all the way up to our brilliant women's super league um, and so there's been massive change and I and I celebrate that and I welcome it um, there's still work to do in areas uh, but I think overall um, you know as Anne Helen said that those those opportunities are are um, marketed and promoted a lot more now and girls know that there are opportunities for them to play football at any level um, and in any environment and that's brilliant. Okay um, and so moving on then so now there are more opportunities for girls to play football it's sort of easier for them to find a local club to start playing but once they start playing, I'd say the main topic today is that within sport in general, that sort of 14 and upwards age group is, is sort of identified as an area for, for many reasons why boys and girls would fall away from sport. But it seems that that level is higher amongst, amongst girls. And I'm sure that both of you sort of recognise it within football itself. So I don't know, whether, Ali, whether you can touch on some of the reasons that you've sort of noticed to begin with, that you've noticed some of those reasons why girls do tend to drop away at that, that age group. Yeah, um, so I think some of the reasons I've noticed have been quite interesting uh, in the past, even just around um, body shape. So the way that sport and physical exercise changes the way your body looks. And I've known some girls in the past to kind of not be very happy when they start to maybe look a bit more muscular or their thighs start to get a bit bigger and things like that. So I think um, for me, there's kind of a program of work around um, trying to help educate both um, males and females in um, that actually what, what is beautiful and that anything is beautiful and that you don't have to look a certain way in order to be a woman or you don't have to look a certain way in order to be a man um, and I think with teenage girls in particular there's a there's a lot going on there there's a there's a lot of of physical body changes there's there's a lot of sort of emotional um, psychological kind of pressures and um, there's, there's so much going on in the teenage brain, you know, that the, your brain doesn't stop developing until you're in your 20s. Um, and I think there's lots of um, social pressures and peer pressures um, to kind of conform. And I think a lot of time for teenage girls, if they can find um, a comfortable and a fun space among other teenage girls to participate in a sport, then for me, they will, they will keep at it. But if at any point there is a peer pressure which makes them feel like it's not the right thing to do or they feel excluded for any reason, for me, in my experience, that's where the, the difficulties have come. Um, so tally with some of your, your experiences, Anne-Helene, that if you're sort of giving those, that sort of peer pressure is, is partly one of the reasons that will pull girls in that 14 to 16 age group away from from playing football or sport in general uh, yeah of course it, it can because i think if you go back to why um, you ask um, children and young people you know why they take up sports uh, you would get slightly varied uh, answers if you if you commit to a team sport or if you commit to a, an individual sport you, you would get so if you go back to that, uh, definitely th that will be a, a big thing as well. Uh, so the, the dynamics of, of things and, and also the importance of, um, of uh, leadership uh, to have an awareness of, of, uh, of the areas that, that Ali is mentioning. And, um, and I think if, if um, what, what's really important and where you see uh, huge differences, I think is is when um, someone has has had the opportunity 
has had the good fortune to to get uh, a more a holistic uh, uh, kind of education, uh, if you call it that, uh, going to to your uh, club's training sessions and uh, uh, you do a little bit more than just maybe train for the 60 minutes, 90 minutes, you do something before, you do something after, um, then um, uh, which, which could be small messages, small discussions and, and, and various things. If players that have grown up with that and, uh, and um, what do you say, become, uh, become more aware and, and get a little bit more tools then uh, then there's a big difference in that I think but but worry is we were talking about dropout rates 14 to 16 but what we can <clears throat> in Sweden anyway what we uh, what we have seen for a long time is that our highest numbers of uh, children participating in football is at uh, the age of 11 so after 11 already then it's it starts to to uh, to come down and uh, and I think so we we have got a a bigger <laughs> an even bigger uh, thing to to look at and um, and very much you know what what kind of uh, uh, what kind of feelings do we want to create with with young uh, with, with kids starting um, um, in Sweden the last couple of years uh, has been um, worked to, a lot towards this about um, uh, making sure that we don't select uh, or having well deselect uh, players at at such an early age, uh, which uh, leads to things like the having the right playing format for the different ages. Uh, um, I know that's been the case in the UK for a long time, but we still have a, a lot of coaches that that still think that eleven football should be played eleven v eleven, no matter you know how small they are and. Um, but but those kind of things to, is so important that um, that it's the right playing format that they get enough playing time and etc. So um, um, and then when it comes to the kind of work that I do, I, I don't know if you want me to to show that at this, this point, Steve. Oh or, yes, why not? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think I think just now. having just having an awareness as a as a coach um, and and bringing that into your discussions with your players individually or, or collectively as a group um, to, to making them aware. I think um, there's some areas that are really, what do you say, uh, uh, common. Can you see the first one? The, fr the first slide, is that uh, Not yet. Um, no, no. Oh, sorry. no, you see, you see, you see. No, let's go here. I'm, uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, of course, share screen. Um, here we go, I think. Is it working? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, know the different areas that, that um, we, in the line of work that I do just now with, with the player development and, um, and talking about different things around a uh, player's an individual player developing uh, within football, uh, there could be different areas. So uh, let's just see if I'm, here we go, yeah. Uh... Oh, wait. Uh, animation, should have taken that away. Um... Uh, well, this uh, what what Ellen was mentioning before about well a little bit peer pressure but but being you know uh, you want you join a group because you want to uh, you, you you like to to do things with uh, with your friends uh, but there are, there will also be players that uh, maybe want to to become a little bit better and, and make sure you know, if I can if I can uh, if I can reach that but I'm I'm still uh, maybe in my uh, uh, the environment that I've been in for a while, but uh, as a coach, try and help individuals, not just not just to, to treat them as a as a group of, of players, but but um, but actually they are individuals as well. So we we can train individually. Um, and and what does that mean? But that's a challenge because sometimes young girls they 
they don't want to break out from the group and uh, and do things uh, because it's it, it might be seen as yeah I'm <laughs> I'm uh, I'm a little bit different but but everyone as I say this about looking at them as individuals so that can be a challenge if you have players um, that want to do a little bit extra but because their friends aren't doing it then it's hard for them to do it. Um, I think in the age group that we're talking about, getting injured can be a can be quite a, a big challenge uh, about getting the right help, about avoiding injuries. Uh, the uh, the rate of ACLs in, in women's football and even with the young girls is is um, it's it's way too high and um, and and long term injuries. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, it's it's a difficult thing, and, and it can for many become the end as well. Uh, if you don't get the right help uh, uh, with getting rehab or uh, the correct rehabilitation, so I think having that awareness and what it means to to actually uh, support players and not not uh, uh, losing them to the game. Um, in those age groups, it's very, since we say there is a little dropout rate, it's also very uh, normal that um, uh, you sometimes have to, like the groups that have been together for a while, they, they will now have to merge with another group or they have to, someone has to step up and play with the, the senior players. Um, so changing environment is a, is a major challenge, uh, whether it's just, in Sweden it's quite common that, um, uh, on a Saturday when the senior coach uh, notices that, oh, I'm not going to have enough players. I better f phone up the youth coach and uh, she has to come and play. Oh, but we have a game in the morning. Oh, that's fine. You, she can come and play in the afternoon with the seniors as well or sit on the bench. And, and just that is a, uh, that's a difficult thing. And I think it scares a lot of players in the, those age groups that they get pulled from from many directions and uh, and they're not still in that safe group that they were used to be when they were 11 12 or or what have you and that's uh, so as a club and as a coach how do you work with those things um moving home is maybe a, that's a long country sweden by the way so some some countries are even longer but anyway if um, that can be the case as well uh, for studies um Maybe uh, maybe when they get a little bit older, but uh, it's it can happen already from the age of sixteen, and that's a and that starts to happen on the on the women's side uh, now as well. It was maybe more common on the boys' side before. <laughs> and as we say, if you go up to senior football, uh, suddenly you maybe not get equal playing time anymore. You become a substitute, and and dealing with with those things, and uh, and how to how to approach it, and how to be prepared, uh, and very much this as well. Um, so this could be a, a little promising youth national team player that entered a. Uh, a professional team where you see Marta there. So from being a, the star, and then and then you not not become a, a nobody, but you become a, a little star among bigger stars. That's a big challenge uh, as well, and and um, and can also um, what do you say? Scare scare them off somehow. Increased competition and so on uh, so i think just having an awareness for that and and these are the things i'm not gonna uh, but you can have a look yourself but but as as a coach have a have a little bit of a plan that's what what do you want to do to to prevent uh or to to uh, deal with uh, the challenges and and provide some some tools and um, and i think the the last thing that it's said here what what can be quite common uh, because we're talking about teenagers is uh, uh, and uh, I think Ali, I, I can't remember the word you, you used for that, but you, you have all kinds of uh, uh, internal struggles with yourself. So it's, um, it's as a coach and everyone around to have that knowledge that it's try and provide them with toolboxes because it's okay to have periods with bad motivation and low self-confidence. It's, 
it's part of it. And it's um, so someone can can maybe go out from the game for a little while, but you have to stay in touch and, and you can actually you can actually get them back uh, quite quickly um, if you don't give up hope because it is it is a challenge, but it, it might just be a challenge for a, um, uh, a shorter period of time if we have patience. Okay, great. No, I think yeah, that the final slide is um, a really, really good one. We might have to get you to put that back on the screen a couple of times in the next uh, hour or so. Um, but yeah, I don't know whether we can uh, unshare that now, Anna yeah. Lane, as I yeah. sort of move on to to Ali and, and sort of pick up on a few of the things that you sort of brought up in that slide, and also maybe to paraphrase um, a question from Laurie McGinley. Um, Ali, um, we're going to uh, pick up the unshare there. I'm, I'm uh, trying to find it. I've lost it. <laughs> should either be probably at the top of your screen now. Yeah, uh, that's where I'm looking for it. Uh, or down at the bottom. Uh, I thought you had like the major remote. Uh, it's actually disappeared. Um, uh, can I just... Did that disappear? No? <laughs> Do I appear non-technical now? Um, hmm. okay, is it still, is it gone now? Is it away? Yes. <laughs> okay. right, we're there. We're there. We will, yeah. we will have that one back up. So yeah, to paraphrase a question from, from Laurie slightly. Um, See, Ali, we sort of mentioned earlier some of the, the, the social aspects, which, you know, you know, it's hard to control those things that are going on within wider society. But in terms of you as a, as a coach and getting that engagement right with the players, is it more than just getting a balance between sort of the um, challenge and your players' skill levels? Yeah, so I think, I mean, we talk a lot, about uh, creating the right environment um, for players. And um, for me, to, in order to teach someone, I've got to reach them first. I've got to know who they are, what makes them tick, how they operate. And Anne Helen touched on it earlier when she, when she talked about, you know, co coaching the individual. They, yes, they make up a group, but you've got lots of different personalities. All three of us, I imagine, are quite different in lots of ways. Um, and so for me, it's about engaging them as individuals, first and foremost, who are they as people? And there can be really basic things like greeting players as they arrive at a session, calling them by name, using their names. And also, I think what I would stress is that all of this takes time. I think sometimes, especially in the world we live in now, we want this sort of instant results. Um, getting to know someone takes time. And I'm not going to, if I walked into, so any of the coaches watching, if I walked into one of their sessions now, I'm not going to know all their players as individuals. But what I would try to do is make them feel at ease. And I think um, it's really important for coaches to kind of, you know, display the behaviours that they want to see in their players. So... I don't want to be late and I don't want to shout at anyone and I'm not going to swear at someone and I'm certainly not going to be physically violent. You know, I'm not, I'm going to treat those players as though I want them to treat me, but also as I want them to treat each other. Um, I think, yes, there's definitely, particularly with girls, I think um, sometimes I feel like, especially maybe with younger girls, um, but I've seen it, it with teenage girls as well. Sometimes I think there's a bit of a myth in girls football that, they they don't want competition and that they just all want to you know hang out as friends and have a chat and maybe kick the ball about and in my experience that couldn't be further from the truth they love competition they love getting involved they love you know challenging each other and challenging themselves and so i think it's about setting that challenge at the right level for your group and yes maybe probably needing to tweak it here and there for certain individuals um but you know, girls thrive in competitive environments just as much as boys do. Um, so I don't know if I've answered the, the question, but yeah, I think it's, I just think it's a, it's a balance of all of those things. Okay, no, no, that's, uh, yeah, some great points away there from, yeah, first of all, setting that, that right environment. 
Um, I guess, Anne Helene, once you have that, um, probably now to sort of use a bit of Laurie's question more directly, where he asks, um, do you think coaches struggle with new ideas when working with young players? As they may not get it right away, i.e. they can't think of anything, so they will do fitness for an hour or so, as, a, as an example. They will just fall back on very easy things rather than sort of taking on board sort of new ideas on how to engage. Mm. Yeah, you talk about actual, actual training sessions or uh, drills or uh, games. Yeah, uh, I, can, I can see that. And, uh, and uh, we've all been there uh, where we have, uh, we try out things and we have high expectations that everything should look perfect straight away. Or, um, and, and I think the, the only, the, the only, answer I have to that is, is yeah well next time think through the the, the ways you present something um, and uh, and how you uh, um, maybe you can simplify it a little bit to, to start with and um, uh, and also this is a for me then both having like the Swedish background with the uh, with different training methodologies and, and the, the UK as well I think the the, the one that comes to mind is that you should always let them try. Um, you shouldn't talk too much. Uh, like we, we talk now and I, I use a lot of words, but it's, it's this thing about, about preparing yourself so that uh, it's like saying to a player, don't use too many touches. Yeah. If you're a coach, don't use too many words. You try and show and get them to, to feel it. Um, and then, and then be, be a little bit comfortable that it's not perfect. Um, I never, uh, it's it's probably you have to be patient with yourself as well and uh, and I think when Ali said this about if I would come to to one of your groups uh, uh, in a team training session uh, what what you would uh, try and, and do um, of course but uh, uh, I would also say then I I can assure you this is uh, this is going to be quite a normal training session in in a way because it's not it's not. Uh, 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 football has been done for so many years, and we we package it a little bit in different shapes. But um, but it's like building a house. So you you don't you're not going to have a house built in in one day or one training session. But just to get them to feel it um, uh, for a little time, and and uh, and not maybe talk so much and and overcoach, uh, give too many instructions, and then come back to it again. And uh, but it's it's preparing a little bit, and then it's about showing and letting them feel rather than uh, over coaching. <laughs> just, sorry, Steve, can I just make a couple of points on that? I, I agree with absolutely everything you said, Anne Helen, and I think um, there's something around, you know, learning takes time for all of us. And the amount of times I've heard other coaches um, uh, get, you know, not necessarily outwardly towards the players, but, you know, maybe just talking to me saying, oh, why don't they understand this? We did this last week. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, we did this once a week ago. A week is a long, long time in the world of a child and a teenager. Um, so, yes, absolutely. Having the patience with yourself and also with your players. Um, and I think, um, I can't remember my second point now. But yeah, it was it was just basically around just um, oh that was it around um, if you feel like you've done a, a session and maybe it hasn't gone as you want you know seek that feedback seek that seek the feedback from the people you are trying to teach so ask your players but also be mindful about how um, and when and where you ask players to evaluate because they might not feel comfortable saying what they think in front of everyone or if one person says something and they are the the sort of um they hold the power socially in the group everyone else might just agree with them so i i think we talk a lot in football about seeking feedback but i think we do need to be mindful about you know how when and where we seek it from players certainly that is uh, clearly then Anna Lane, there's um very clear dynamics within within team sports. I mean, how's that dynamic? Is it slightly different if you're working with 14, 15, 16 year old girls than it is with senior players? 
or is that dynamic pretty much the same? And as you say, you, you know who the people who you can filter information through and, and who are the key people to get feedback from. You're talking players now, or you're talking also like people around you as we'll start, with the, we'll start with the players. Yeah. Because you're working with the players and sort yeah. of trying to get that information across and that feedback from think, them. Yeah. I think the most important thing is, is never to be uh, uh, generic in, in your approach. It's, it's like saying um, this about coaching men or coaching women. Um, but you're, co you, you're coaching like a group or you're coaching individuals. So first you have to get to know them and they have to get to know you. Um, I think that's more important uh, to, to understand that than to, to think if I'm uh, coaching Caroline Sager, who's 35 years old, uh, you know, 200 caps or whatever. And, and if I'm coaching, or if I'm coaching a 15 year old, that's coming to one of our district uh, team trainings. Um, um, it's more important, you know, that, that I've gotten to know them and they've gotten to know me. Um, uh, because if, if I, if I use the same kind of, um, uh, communication uh, during a session or uh, ma mainly maybe during a session because it's uh, I think uh, outside it's it's always about uh, uh, what do you say communicating as a normal individual without um, or having a dialogue um, so then it always depends on what's actually coming <laughs> back to you as a coach you otherwise it just talking monologue instead um, so um, I would more say that, um, uh, but of, of course, if you if you know two groups the same way, you you're maybe a little bit more not direct, but you could you can explain your explanations are a little bit shorter and briefer with uh, with older players uh, than they are with with the younger. Uh, but that comes on maybe <laughs> fourth place or something. So. Mm. And these uh, sort of age groups, we're sort of now in a sort of alley in um, terms, sort of like the first sort of generations of youngsters growing up purely with in a digital age, and they're sort of kind of born with a mobile phone in their hand. Um, does this sort of create more interesting challenges for engaging with them? Do you find them they're sort of more? slightly probably more empowered than, than previous generations so that sort of encouraging that sort of player-centered learning is, is a little bit easier with this generation um yeah i think um technology and social media in particular throw up uh, a lot of interesting uh, dynamics to coaching teenage girls in particular and um i think I think a lot of it again depends on the context in which you are coaching so there will be some academy environments for example that do not allow any sort of mobile phones or what you know everything stays in the bag the bags away from the pitch and nothing you know nothing is allowed to to touch that pitch other than the footballs and the players um, I've coached in slightly different environments as well, where I guess they have been slightly more relaxed in that respect. And I remember um, one night in particular at coaching where we hadn't actually officially started the session yet, but girls were starting to filter in and there was an amazing rainbow and it was amazing. You could see the whole, whole pretty much all of it, which is usually quite rare when you see rainbows. Um, and the girls, you know, they, they were like full team, but they were still like, oh, the rainbow, the rainbow. And they all wanted to get a photo for their Instagram. And um, I let them do it. And I let them all gather in a group. And I took a photo of all of them standing in front of this rainbow because otherwise it, it just becomes this distraction and this thing that they want. But by letting them have it in that moment, it got it out of the way. And then they focused on the session. And I think, again, it's about knowing your players. They know me well enough and I knew them well enough to know that they could have that thing in that moment. And then it was about focusing on the football. Um, and that was the respect that we built up. But as I said earlier, that takes time. Um, and, you know, had I done that the first time I've ever coached them, they might have thought maybe I was a bit of a soft touch or something. And they might have kind of taken advantage of that in the future. Um, so I think it's just, you know, as Anne Helen said, it's about, it's about knowing 
the individuals and knowing the group in front of you. Um, but yeah, I think I think social media and technology is really interesting. I think one of the things that that really surprised me, because um, as I said, I haven't been coaching for a long, long time, um, was that a lot of the girls that, and it might just be a coincidence of my experience, other coaches I'm sure have got different experiences, but a lot of the girls that I happen to have coached um, don't watch football and don't play FIFA on the computers. And, and I think sometimes some coaches who might be used to coaching boys who then transition over to coaching girls or suddenly find themselves coaching girls, um, use the same sort of tactics or ways of engaging and communicating and then are quite surprised when these girls are like, I don't know who you're talking about. Um, and so I think there's two points there. There's one, you know, again, get to know your player because I will know in a group of players who absolutely knows who, you know, the Spurs first team is <coughs> and who doesn't have a clue. But also, I think we've got a lot more opportunities now to start talking about female players as well as just, you know, Premier League male players. And I would encourage coaches, regardless of the genders you coach, to start talking about those female players, like educate yourself on those female players and talk to boys about female players too, because then we start to normalise it. Um, and I think that's really important going forward. No, no, yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, Anna Lane, um, say sort of carrying on then from uh, Ali's said and obviously pick on a bit, little bit more on terms of that sort of like normalizing sort of girls and women's football across <laughs> the men's game yeah. plus then touching a bit more then on that aspect of um technology and how you can bring that into training sessions a bit more or do you find that actually the players that you work with are contrary to general beliefs are for that hour are really focused on what they're doing and they quite happily will sort of put their social media lives to one side for for that that moment in time uh yeah um there's uh many questions in one there um but um uh but of course first um using words you know like say what, what's what's normal um um, so what's the norm? If um, I think everything starts with yourself as well. I'm a, a great believer in that, that, uh, uh, that if you always compare, you, there are still many, with, even within women's football, that do comparisons with, with men's football. And yeah, it's, it is the same sport. Um, so uh, to a certain extent, you, you, uh, you compare in, in terms of using the same... <laughs> The same area and and what have you, but but otherwise you always have to be very mindful yourself of of uh, uh, what you're referring referring to, um, and and that's uh, that could be coaches as well, and um, and even I don't think it's it's not that many years ago if you if you ask uh, it's, it's like uh, if you go to the doctors then then someone uh, yeah it's a doctor so what did he say. So it's it's the same thing maybe you know within football if it's a coach you may be uh, subconsciously you think it's it's a man so um, everything starts with that uh, you know what's the norm and what you compare with um, which I think is is very important so that um, if you want to uh, be part of uh, creating the next generation uh, of, of football players then. You should always be very mindful if you're talking about uh, uh, the men's team or the, the women's team. It's not a first team. So because the club hopefully has two first teams then. So it's all those kind of, you know, what, what words and what titles you, you put on things. It's the men's national team. It's the women's national team. Luckily now, I think uh, many countries do that and, and are aware of it. Um, and I think that that's shows the first signal. That's hugely important but but also everyone working within let's say women's football that we are mindful of it and and also never um, uh, never revert to to using using that uh, what ali says about um, i think it the, the, you say the question about well technology using um, i think uh, it has two sides so of course uh, if you're um, 
if you want to to work with a group then you want you want everyone to feel that they are you know in the moment they're here and now and uh, and i don't think that that's the the biggest problem is probably not 14 15 16 year olds with the mobile phones uh, i mean adults most people if if something goes in the pocket you know it vibrates then it doesn't take two seconds before it it comes up and everyone needs to check messages so it's a problem that that everyone or the the, the big part of society today have um so again we're using maybe that for the 50th time now the word environment but but what does it include uh, actually if you work with a with a group for a, that you sit down and you talk about these things because many people aren't aren't even aware it's such a common thing today so uh, um, but we can use it uh, what you're just mentioning as uh, uh, for maybe players that Ali says aren't watching football regularly um, but we can maybe we can maybe make them watch because it's there are um, different opportunities to wa just watch you know fun clips cool clips of of uh, skills and tricks and uh, highlight videos of uh, of role models and uh, through that you can actually catch someone's interest uh, so you have to do a little bit of research as a as a coach yourself and uh, there's loads obviously to of clips if you want to watch messi or ronaldo but there are actually today a lot of things on female players as well and I think that's a big part of, uh, of our job as coaches to um, to expose them to role models um, and in ways and shapes and formats and you know size that they can uh, that they can absorb. Um, so uh, so that's huge because it's at the end of the day that's what um, uh, when you get exposed to that uh, um, maybe you don't you're not going to become the next. Uh, Megan Rapino, Steph Houghton, uh, you maybe not going to, but it increases your uh, your own self value as a as a young girl, uh, watching other strong women within your sport that has a lot of positive attributes. So, and and that definitely in this uh, uh, technological world world we can we can take advantage of as coaches. Yeah, fantastic, Anne Helene. Um, I think that kind of brings us nicely onto that kind of topic that we're kind of looking at the balance of developing kind of elite pathways and, and just players who are going to be, you know, probably don't play at a professional level, but will have a lifelong love of football, will play at grassroots level and, and probably understanding then what is, what is women's football culture? Is it going to be a straight copy and paste? This is the men's kind of model and we just copy that hook, line and sinker or... Or is this women's football, be it a very like a hundred year old startup, you know, you're kind of free to, in some ways, do it, you know, as a women's game that fits within what women women are look, looking for. What is the, let's say, what would be for you would be the blueprint for doing that? Mm -hmm. um, so personally, I hope we don't copy and paste the men's game. Um, in this country, you know, we were banned for 50 years. So let's actually take advantage of that. Let's have a look at the men's game. Let's maybe learn from some of the ways that it might not have worked out so well. And let's try to avoid those kind of errors or, or things that, that wouldn't fit the women's game. That's my personal opinion. Um, I think it's a balance between wanting to promote it and, and it needs to have a commercial edge to it so that we get the money um, so that we can invest. Um, but I think it's definitely it needs to be a bottom up and a top down approach. You're not going to ha have a generation of England lionesses if you're not encouraging seven year olds to play in a park on a Sunday. So I think, you know, we need to develop grassroots uh, football and we need to develop grassroots coaches in order to develop those future players. I think something that often strikes me is that, and I completely understand why it is, um, but the sort of, it, it strikes me as odd that if you are coaching, say you're coaching a seven-year-old and that's their introduction to football and you're trying to instill this passion that will hopefully last their whole life, that you would get a volunteer 
to do that. Or you would get someone who has never really coached before to do that. I think we, I think we definitely need volunteers. I was a volunteer for, for many years, um, but they need to be accompanied by professionals who understand the art of coaching each age group. I think as coaches, we have to coach the person and the player in front of us, but we are developing them and preparing them for what comes next. And I think it takes experience and expertise across the pathway uh, in order to really understand how you prepare someone for what comes next. So I think it's a balance between wanting to, um, lots of coaches want to try and get to the top and lots of coaches think the top is elite male football. Um, but actually be the expert in the field you're currently in. So if you are coaching seven year old girls on a Saturday, be an expert at that, uh, you know, learn your craft and perfect it um, because you owe it to the players in front of you to be the best coach for them in that moment, rather than thinking about, oh, well, if I do this, then I can do that, 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 and that. That's my personal opinion. It's that, uh, yeah, it sort of throws back to the, the whole general idea of, of, of being in, in the moment, not only for, yeah, for, your, for your players. Um, and Helene, sort of build on that, and we're sort of working towards, again, another question from, from Laurie on sort of the level of coaches and that sort of idea of one with the coaching education that coaches are getting is that education being one specific to the age group and two, sort of also catering for the sort of nuances and differences between girls and boys in terms of their mental approach in terms of their physiology you mean if the current coach education are catering? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it's uh, it's probably better than than ever. Uh, it hasn't been a it hasn't been a great area at all um, previously. But uh, I think uh, I think the uh, the national associations and the district well the district associations following on to that have uh, have taken it more more seriously. Uh, so that the content uh, covers uh, for all aspects, um, both genders and and different levels as, as well. But uh, uh, we're probably not we're not there yet because the the research in in so many areas are not done as as thoroughly as on on women as as on men's yet. Um, but I, but there is there is some and um, and we really. We say we need to demand that um, that courses uh, show, you know, equal uh, or take equal examples from um, 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 during the, during the education. Um, but I think ve and very much as well is also uh, the the coach educators that that actually takes on takes a course and and leads the course if if. Um, it's the same thing as, as hearing outfield coaches saying, I don't know anything about goalkeeping. And if you're a under nine, you know, coach, you have to know that it's a, it's part of football. That's how we're, we've organized. So you're, you, you have to know the basics to help uh, someone you ask, you know, do you want to be in goals? Um, and, and it's the, it's the same when it comes to a coach educator. And I think you, you really, um, uh, the, the, the times have gone when we when we just should sit and you know you have to use examples for what what how would that look you know uh, within uh, within the context of a, of a girls under nine team if you go to a coaching course so again you know what are the norms and and uh, and I think we're not there yet because because there is still an imbalance of uh, of maybe the um, uh, the, the role description of coach educators that they they also need to have that and of course it's a it's a big uh, we have a big uh, big task always football when when something has to go through changes it's going to take take some time because it's the world's biggest sport and it has the most number of people involved in it so so to get messages across and to get everyone to live by it day by day is uh, is something but in that everyone can play a part and I think that's 
I, I never sit in a room uh, quiet, you know, if it's if the if all perspectives aren't brought into a to a discussion. And I think that's if you're if you're working within women's football, that's that's your uh, responsibility as well. Uh, because I think then that's what's made us come, you know, so far in such a short space of time. Um, so we can make it even better. I, I would say the, the, the courses, if, if that was the question, it's a long yes. answer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, on, on that as well, Ali, I mean, you've, you've, um, I know you've done your, your, your badges. Um, so when it on those courses, and I was speaking to you that you've said, you know, the presentation is, is becoming more, um, integrating women's football into those presentations themselves, you know, simple little things. We're having women's footballers and coaches on the sort of covers of the folders you're giving out. But when you sort of delve into the actual the content itself, what you're being taught is that sort of highly relevant for going to coaching a group of 14 year old girls, or is it still aimed at this is how you would coach a group of 14 year old boys? now go and do exactly the same with a with a group of girls or is that becoming more integrated into into the coaching badges that you've done yeah um so i think you know in my personal experience um it's been some and some uh the, the more recently it has improved so more recently yes there's been you know like an england lioness <coughs> sorry excuse me an England lioness on on the cover of my UA for B folder, um, but when I did my level one, for example, which interestingly was a female only course, led by a male coach educator, so it wasn't really a female only course um, because we were all instructed by a man, and um, I personally don't like female only courses. I prefer to be in a mixed co um, cohort. Uh, I think it prepares us better for the world of football, which even women's football is still predominantly male. Um, but also I think, you know, I, you know, and Helen touched on diversity and I think we learn more from being in diverse groups. So I personally enjoy learning from other male coaches. I just wish I hadn't been the only woman in the room on most of my coach education courses, as I often was. That is changing, though. Um, and I think it's really important to have that mixture. I'd like to see more female coach educators. Um, and yes, I'd like to see the content and just the discussions, because often on courses, it's, it's the stuff that happens um, in the break times or you know at lunchtime or whatever and, and and there's lots of conversations about football but if you are the only female in a room of 25 men including all the coach you know the tutors that topic of conversation mm -hmm. is likely going to be about men's football and then if you mention the WSL or, or, or you know women's football chances are they're not going to know what you're talking about or even if they do they're not going to feel as comfortable and confident to discuss that um so i think yeah we just sort of need more women in the room but i i, I think progress is being made it's just being made quite slowly okay um and helene um with uh, laurie's question sort of specifically around um coaching in in sweden as compared to scotland where he says um yeah, a lot of the coaches in Scotland that are working with younger children have a have a level one, but might struggle with the technical side. Is is this um, something that's different in Sweden? Where you'll have higher level qualified coaches working with the younger age groups. Oh, that's that's probably similar. That uh, again, as I said, well, being a big sport and. Uh, and uh, needing many volunteers and, and coaches, it's. Uh, I think that's one of the, it's one of the the daily challenges for for local clubs to, to ensure that that coaches have that um, side, and and it's an important aspect, of course. I think I'm I'm part of my uh, uh, my uh, my first club. I'm sitting on the board there after having been uh, abroad for many years, and then I, I joined them again and. And we um, we talk about that all the time, but the 
it's also the the challenges of having the time put aside to to take courses uh travel away somewhere and and and, and do it um, in sweden it's it's um it's quite common or the first courses uh, can be arranged within the club and then the coach educator comes out to the club and, and they they bring uh, the number of coaches together to, to do coach education so i think it's it's really important and i think that's if you can if you can do it in, in that format instead uh, you can get more coaches through the coaching badges and get that uh, background but the other thing i, w- I would say that i think Clubs that uh, try and and uh, and have a, an eye into the future a little bit. Um, 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 the, we, you could say the, the bigger clubs have had it for a long time that they uh, they have coordinators or uh, uh, different uh, that are responsible for a couple of age groups. But I, I think that can be done in, in small clubs as well. Um, that uh, as well as you. Uh, make sure you have a secretary on the board you you should have like a, a, a youth coordinator that uh, that's it is an extra person but it's probably even more important than having a uh, maybe a, a third assistant coach or or something with the seniors it's it's more important to have to have that person who can support the youth coaches a little bit and and guide them um, because before they have gone on, started going on coaching courses, you can you can get a little bit of help and and just this is good to do this and and if you do it in that way, it's, to be very to do things that are simple but uh, that are achievable. Um, and sometimes uh, coaching co- a coaching course or taking many, um, yeah, it's only achievable over over a longer period of time because of people's commitment. So I I think you can you can uh, cater for it uh, with both those things. Yeah, making sure that, or in, encouraging um, all your youth coaches to take badges, but also having someone who works with it every day. You, that's an education as well, or every week when it's within a club. Okay, great. Um, I think we sort of move on back to, uh, yeah, educating the players. Uh, rather than the coaches, although uh, indirectly, hopefully, we'll be uh, educating coaches at the same time. Um, when we're looking at this sort of age group again, 14 to 16, and sort of again, there'll be players there with aspirations of making a career out of the football, and some who will just play at a at a sort of a, a hobby level. Um, as coaches, how do you get that balance right within the group? that you are sort of balancing this idea of an elite pathway versus, you know, sort of just fostering that love of the game that, that, you know, that you will not be the last coach that any of your players have, that you are now, you know, sort of gladly passing them on to the next level and, and that level will just keep growing and growing. What are the, what are the, how do you go about creating that balance within a group where you're going to have slightly different levels of players within it? So I, I think um, I think that's that that's the challenge that every coach has at any level. To be honest, mixed ability. Um, I think even when you at that, that age group, I should say, um, and I think even working in academy environments um, where by that age, I think um, most players, if they're on a pathway in in an official academy. Uh, would likely have aspirations to play at the highest level. I think it's more um, perhaps in grassroots and amateur levels um, that uh, it, among teenage girls, you will have a bit more of a mixture of players who just want to play kind of recreationally and then players that, that want to try and um, kind of maybe then join an academy or something at some point. Um, I think the challenge, though, regardless, in my opinion, is about um, setting, you know, setting out the session so that you understand as a coach, first and foremost, what your key outcomes are as you go in. And those outcomes need to relate to the players. You know, I'm not coaching this session for me. I'm coaching it for them. So why are we working on this? We have to be working on something that the players need rather than 
oh, I saw this video on YouTube, so I'd quite like to coach that session. You know, it needs to relate to what they need and what, what you're working towards with them. Um, and then I think it's about um, coaching is very kind of organic, isn't it? You react to, it's like the game itself. A player has to read and react um, to what happens in the game. And I feel like coaches have to read and react to what ha happens in a training session. So you will set the challenge and then you have to watch. And as Anne Helen said earlier, you know, stop talking and just observe and see what they can give you and try not to jump in too soon because often players will self-correct. But if you jump in before they have the opportunity to self-correct, you'll never know whether they'd have got it right by themselves or not. And, and that takes a lot of practice as a coach. I get that wrong all the time. Um, but I think, yeah, it's about basically setting out the session and then seeing what the players give you and then adapting it. And that might mean adapting it for individuals rather than the whole group. And I think that's an art as well, knowing when to stop everyone and when to just pull out certain players or, or just speak to players as they come past you and things like that. But, but again, that links back to the point we've made earlier around understanding your individuals and understanding your group. Okay, and so on that sort of idea of understanding the individuals um, and sort of then kind of crystallizing that a little bit more and Helene and um, so sort of bringing in this idea of individual development plans which are they're quite common at the sort of elite levels but obviously with resource size wise probably not as easy to to, to sort of bring in if you're at a, a grassroots coach mm -hmm. can I should I flip or put up the slides yes why not a little see if i'm quicker this time is it uh, do you get the whole or do you get the presentation thing you get the presentation there yep there yep. we go perfect uh i think you a lot of things we we've discussed in in uh what do you say what what uh what comes with being a coach for uh, for any kind of player but we're talking about young players and uh, it has to come from something you know the how you want to work and you have to be clear you know with the philosophy you know how do you think that actually someone develops to be the best they can be yeah, some some becomes the next kim little or uh, kosa slane that's in in this picture but uh, but to be the best that they can be and that's that's all we know at at, uh, at that age with players. But to have an understanding that there are so many, so many factors, uh, which you know, some we are directly involved in as coaches, but some, some we are less uh, part of, but, but we still have to have it in our philosophy, uh, being aware and, and also creating, what do you say, uh, uh, that kind of understanding, uh, uh, the player has to create an understanding for that or becoming aware of all these different factors. Um, um, so, so obviously we, we have a lot of things and I touched on it earlier that, um, that the quantity of, of trainings and, and matches uh, to have an awareness of, of what does that really uh, bring to each individual? Does everyone want to train as much within a group? Uh, does someone want to train a little bit less? Someone want to train a little bit more? And can we cater for that as, as coaches? Uh, look at them as individuals as well. And um, the quality of, of matches that, it's like um, being, being very good at, uh, at a subject in school or and having finished a book really early. Uh, are you just asked to, okay, now you just have to sit and wait for the rest or can you get another book and, and continue? Um, so that's the same kind of philosophy behind uh, quality of, of matches uh, if you're looking at individuals and um, so there's just different things and I'm, I'm not going to go into detail on every but but to have an understanding what kind of uh, environment exists around the, each player in terms of family and friends and and uh, your your background a little bit because uh, some uh, some might have better support from home uh, in terms of uh, uh, transport or, or anything uh, and, and you have to you have to know about these things because they have an effect in in everyday 
everyday life. And um, and we already spoke about the the coaches, uh, the the quality, whereas coaching education is is one one aspect of it. Um, but the healthy lifestyle, I think we we have such a great responsibility in in uh, in uh, in teaching uh, and making them know more about these these things uh, and getting the tools and and maybe becoming even more motivated, you know, to to look after yourself uh, so that you have a, a healthy lifestyle. Um, and I think about what what Ali mentioned first about the. Uh, the body, uh, the body concept or the concept of, of body shape and, and things like that. But it's then we have to to immediately divert them in a different direction. We're talking about you know healthy lifestyle. You can really become a, a strong individual and and have a and have a have a really healthy life. So uh, and all we haven't even touched on it before, but uh, there's a lot of young, older teenagers that actually drop out from store sport because they they can't uh, they don't think they can actually uh, do sport and uh, be good at school at the same time uh, in the UK periods of, of taking you know, doing your hires and um, those kind of aspects whereas you know if we're prepared and if we quite early you know, uh, try and, and and plan for those things of course you have to be able to to combine the two because uh, you know, a healthy mind lives in a healthy body, so it's it's it should always be there, and um, and and developing this willingness to train um, because it's a it's a great thing, and it's uh, and of course being fun as well. So I think this is what I I've always tried to work from in terms of a philosophy uh, that has to come first if I want to develop and help someone. Um, and the, the football aspects, very important, obviously, technically, tactically, uh, physically, um, but th this side is, is what, what really uh, matters if you want to empower someone to drive their own development, to have an understanding and they ha have that as well. So that leads you on to obviously what you're mentioning before, Steve, if, if that's the kind of coach you want to be, then immediately you, you can't you can't uh, close your eyes to that. It's it's about individual development plan and and it's very it's it's very it's a very simple tool to use. But it it makes sure that you you actually every player that you you have is uh, feels important, feels that uh, they've been seen. Someone someone uh, really takes an interest in you um, and you. Um, and you can do it with very simple questions uh, uh, and having a, a one to one, uh, which is probably should be sh short um, and then happen a little bit frequently rather than having a, a two hour talk with each individual and then never coming back to it again. But then coming back to, to things like this, you can do that easily after a training session that you actually, as, uh, as, uh, natural as uh, putting together the footballs and the bibs and the markers you you know that uh, after this training session i'm gonna speak to molly for five minutes and i'm just gonna um she's written this so i have it in the back of my mind we don't have to sit down with a pen and paper but but just to have a little bit of a structure to something like this uh, i think it doesn't matter if you uh, if if you want to become an elite player or if you just want to make sure that uh, yeah we we get everyone to to uh, create a lifelong love for the game um, i've I've found this um, a good tool to use um, to just to, to make sure so that I know what she wants what each individual really wants it's not what I think she wants or what I think she thinks of she's she's put it down on paper and it's and it's a it's a starting point for something. I mean, Ali, how how important is something like this in terms of you? I know you were sort of saying you're looking at your sessions and you're thinking about the group, but also the individuals within there. There's got to be a purpose to what you do. And how does this enable your players to understand the purpose behind everything you're doing? But giving them that goal setting 
it creates that motivation for them to come and be involved in each and every session yeah definitely i think you know pdps are personal aren't they they are specific to those players and i think and helen touches on a really important point around sort of player ownership so you know their pro progression is as much their responsibility than anyone else's you know it's like that we can help guide them and we can give them the tools and support that they need but they you know that drive ultimately has to come from them so for them to lay out you know their own sort of expectations their own um, areas that they think they want to develop and need to develop is really useful for a coach um, the structure is massively important um, because you know it the, the practice has to be purposeful there's no point just like kicking a ball against a wall you know like you need to you know why, what are we trying to achieve here and i think pdps really help with that structured um kind of approach uh i also think um again it links it back um and helen touched on this but it links it back to the individual in a kind of I think regardless of who you coach, male, female, adult, youth, you know, elite, uh, amateur, everyone likes to feel special. Everyone does. And I think, you know, this is one of the ways where you really focus, focus in on what do, what do you need? What do you need and what do you want to achieve? And how are we going to get you there? And obviously with Anna Lane, with her, there just touched on some of the, the sort of parts of her philosophy that she thinks enables as a coach for her to empower her players. I mean, for you, um, I just sort of <laughs> picked up on that word that making players feel special. You sort of zoom in on what makes them feel good about themselves. You, as players, you focus in more on their strengths than the, their weaknesses. Is that would that encapsulate your main philosophy on how you empower your players, or is there a little bit more to it than that? Yeah, so I think um, personally, I I kind of prefer to work um, from a strengths-based approach. So I pre I prefer to kind of identify uh, by observing, but also with the player, what their strengths are, and kind of build their confidence from there, and 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 so get them to a point where they're feeling good about themselves because they know they they're good at that particular thing and then we start to divert their attention towards the things that they need to develop a bit more but also whilst maintaining that strength because that's the balance as well again is that you don't you can't just focus on things in isolation because if you don't keep practicing all of it the things that they were once strong at they might then need to work on again so um but yes I, I i prefer to start with what a player is good at because i think psychologically it puts them in a better space for learning because learning immediately requires that we come out of our comfort zone um and i think it's really important when we are taking some or guiding someone outside of their comfort zone that we do that in a measured way because if you push someone too far um, actually the learning side of them shuts down because what they are focusing on is surviving. So it, it has to be a measured approach. Um, my sort of personal coaching philosophy, if I'm, you know, I've, I've coached from seven year old girls who have never kicked a football before all the way through to 67 year old women playing walking football. And regardless of who I'm coaching, my approach is built around the three principles of engage, educate and empower. So I want to engage the, the individual first in order to know how best to teach them. Then I'm going to teach them. And then by teaching them, I've, I've empowered them to go away and use those, those tools by themselves. Okay, fantastic. And Anna Helene, is that sort of, what, Ali is sort of speaking about there and sort of yeah, focusing on players' strengths to begin with to help create that sort of environment of being comfortable before slowly kind of yeah, evolving areas where they need to develop. I would say that would be the first part of the question. Mm. Yeah, I think, of course, it's, it's part of what we've been discussing the whole time. It's uh, um, that everyone's unique. So... If you if you say that uh, if that's your 
if that's your starting point, then you also what do you say, must sit down and have a think about what is it that makes you know, yourself unique? What is, what's my uh, strong sides or my, uh, my capacities or uh, wh whatever word you, you use. Um, but that's what makes you special. Um, um, and, and young people might need some help with that because they, if you ask them the question and if you just do an individual development plan like that in a structured way, asking, you know, put down your strengths uh, and then put down your weaknesses, you, they have much, it's much easier for them to put down their weaknesses uh, because it's kind of ingrained in you a little bit. Uh, and, and you're not, you're, you maybe are, you're quite good at that, or I'm okay on that and, and things. So, so you have to, you have to have that understanding as well, that, that it's, it's, it's hard. And even older people have a problem describing themselves. They're more, much more comfortable if someone else describes, you know, what, what are you like, Steve? And, and what's, what's your, what's your strong sides and, and, um, uh, so on. So I think that's that's a, a major thing, absolutely. Um, and um, and you can be aware of of other things as well, but it's uh, that's kind of something completely different. So you train on those things, um, but but really um, probably have to give them the tools to to get that from from an early stage. And I, of course, what I what I do think, I think a little bit when we are. Um, the topic of our conversation here, when we talk so much about individual, um, uh, and for someone which I as well, I, I always say it's it's uh, it's never um, it's never a contradiction, you know, to be an individual in a team sport because uh, you work with that in conjunction with you know doing things together, and uh, and and uh, a big part is I'm I my I'm also trying to do do you better. I'm trying to make someone else better. That's, that's part of a team sport. So it's, it's never a contradiction. I use this word player in focus and, and I've had that on loads of coach education and, and someone sits and says, but hello, uh, we have, this is a team sport. And if we're just going to get a lot of uh, um, uh, selfish people, you know, or selfish players, we're creating that. And I said, no, it's, it's, it's not about that. Uh, absolutely not. But you have to have the understanding that if you have uh, five people in front of you, there's five different, <laughs> five different characters, uh, but it's together that it's, it becomes so much bigger than just five individuals, but it still has to, you still have to uh, focus on both things. So, um, so yeah. And, and then in a, in a team, then you have the, uh, when you put together a team or a group, then it's great if you can use the best, uh, the, the strengths from that and from there and from there and, and, and bring that all together. That's, that's how you, uh, and that's when something becomes unique. You're not just trying to copy something. That's the, I think that's the big, big thing we're talking about the whole time. Yeah. Here. yeah. I want to throw it back to Ali. I did have a, another question for you, Anna Helene, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. And just to throw it back then to Ali and, and then sort of picking up there on, few of the things you're saying um but Ali how yourself as a coach how are you, sort of techniques that you've you have that you've learned and developed over the years that enable you to attune to your players to understand where their strengths and weaknesses are understand them as as individuals sort of yeah help to build build that rapport amongst your players yeah so I think um for me one of the the most important skills for any coach is empathy and um it's about you know just sort of taking a moment to understand those players as individuals and as a team and about what they you know players aren't robots in the same way that coaches aren't robots so whatever has happened to me in that day before i arrive for a training session in the evening you know i as a professional and an adult, I can practice sort of parking it and, and focusing on the session in hand. I think um, it's important to remember that that, that takes practice and, and some adults struggle with that. So I think we need to be patient as children, learn to do it as well, because, you know, it's difficult as a teenage girl if something's happened at school that day or whatever, you know, it's difficult for you to kind of shake that off and then focus on the football. On the flip side of that, um, 
I know uh, from, from girls that I've coached that actually one of the reasons they love playing football is because it allows them that focus. They can just forget about everything else that's going on and, and just focus on that sport. Um, I think also it's around, so, so for me it's about being empathetic and it's also about being authentic. So I try to always be my true self. I don't kind of put on a coaching style or put on a, like a coaching jacket and suddenly I'm a different person. You know, me on the pitch is the same as me talking to you now is the same as if you bumped into me on a bus, you know? Um, and, and I think that's particularly important with children actually, because children see through, uh, when you try and pretend to be someone or you, you pretend that you know something that you don't or that you're able to execute a skill that you can't, children will call you out on that immediately. Um, so I think, yeah, it, um, obviously there are, there are sort of ways of, um, you know, there's things like using forms or using different ways of eliciting feedback from players. And there's, again, depending on the group, there's lots of li little different ways you can do that. You can use coloured cones to mean good, bad, or or confused, or whatever. You know, there's loads of different tricks, as it were. But I think for me, it just comes down to being your authentic self, so that the players feel will learn to feel comfortable around you because they know what they're going to get from you every time you turn up. And that's how I get to know the players, basically, just by being myself. Is that, the, is that the key word in there, Anne Helene? Being authentic, and uh, how how easy is that to be if you're in 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 a sport like like football where you can be changing roles and being asked to deliver different types of sessions depending on you know if you're an assistant coach you're having to take on the the values of the of the head coach. Mm. Of course, as, as I mentioned at the start, I've, I had. Uh, when I go, when I think back, I had role models as a, as a, as a youth coach, and other coaches that I had watched coaching, and um, uh, so of course that's that's part. That's how you, that's how you do as when you're a, a small child as well. You, you imitate, you copy someone's behavior, and and I think so. It's it's part of it. So it's not we're not, no one's you're not the perfect you straight away, but you you kind of go through that. You. Um, what I normally say to players that applies to myself as well that I've, I try and and, and take in things, uh, got like a like a sponge. But then I have to squeeze out the water sometimes to because I'm I'm the sponge. It's that's the actual content. But I should be um, receptive to to take on and and to try things. Um, but of course I won't I won't try things that doesn't feel me. That doesn't that's not part of my uh, my personality or or something i can i can really you know if i'm being questioned i can't i can't i can't answer for it the, the the next day and say that no no well i was just trying out the method that's uh, that's not you you have too much responsibility if you're if you are uh, in a leader role in, a, in taking up that kind of role so but uh, eventually you you have to, you find your own you find your own way, but I, I do think it doesn't, it doesn't come straight away and you might not have the opportunity to work on it frequently, uh, you know, on a daily basis. It's much different to have a coaching session once a week, twice a week, uh, then it also takes time. Uh, so again, I think what um, if someone is, is part and sits and listens to this, if someone's part of the club and, and you don't um, and there's not that kind of character, uh, that role within your club, uh, let's say uh, like a coach mentor um, that can, that can uh, watch and, and give you a little bit of feedback, but from a very what you say, developmental uh, approach, I think. And because most coaches never get that opportunity unless you have come high up the ladder and uh, you take on coach education courses uh, that provides you a license, then you're being observed. So being observed to, to actually get, get help to, to uh, what do you say? Yeah, really nurturing that, what's, what's special about, about you as a coach. And I think that can be done on any level if you, if you have that role and that character in your club, which I think many clubs have, but, but make sure that, yeah, this is, this is how this club operates. And 
um, because you, you you need support as a as a coach as well. Um, absolutely, to um, to be comfortable in that. What Ali just said, because it, uh, that's a lot about becoming comfortable, having you know courage to to do things. Uh, uh, that it's not a copy of someone else, but it's it's you. And it can it can create conflict as well. I don't want to give the impression to anyone um, tuning into this that like this is a perfect <laughs> perfect world, and that all my sessions are amazing, and I get along really well with everyone I've ever coached with. Like um, that being your authentic self can sometimes cause conflict if it doesn't quite marry up with. Uh, your coaching partner for example because a lot of people don't coach in isolation of course they they are either the head coach with an assistant or they are an assistant or in in some cases they are on a kind of equal footing but they are still having to share that education of those players and and so yes absolutely and it I think then it's about sort of <clears throat> knowing when to pick your battles um, and there have been times in the past where I've been asked to give an instruction to players by a coach and I don't agree with the instruction <laughs> and there have been, and, and I learned um, uh, quite painfully actually that um, you have to be careful in that moment about how you how if whether you resist in that moment or you have the conversation afterwards and I resisted in the moment and it didn't go very well. And what I learned from that experience was that actually what would have been better is if I'd have given the instruction to the players, let it unfold and then had a conversation with the coach afterwards and said, I don't really like this instruction and this is why, because this is my coaching philosophy and, and this is my playing philosophy and it didn't quite fit with that. And this is why and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, I guess my point there is that, um, it, it's uh, as Anne Helen said. It, it's not actually always that easy to be your authentic self. Um, so know when to pick your battles would be my advice on that one. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Very much so. Yeah, I did uh, enjoy the uh, analogy of the of the sponge absorbing uh, the information, but then uh, to be to be yourself, you have to squeeze. I was looking for another, but I couldn't, uh, I couldn't find yes. the one. Otherwise, yeah, you're trying too hard to be other people, but yeah. yeah. Doesn't, as Ali says, that doesn't make it an easy, easy path. Um, sort of leave it there with just one final question from, from the audience, just to wrap everything up. Um, do you think the technical aspect is a big part of women's football due to 1v1 dominance? and creating angles when receiving the ball. Say that again, from the very start. So, because it was two oh, subjects. Yeah. So, do you think? Do you think the technical aspect is a big part of women's football due yeah. to 1v1 dominance? Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that um, that actually is is important both in men's and women's football uh, today um, because w what we have uh, uh, we have become quite good in football in uh, in uh, creating a structure uh, a framework um, uh, which we become good in coaching as as coaches um, how how shape you know you you probably hear that word a lot you know shape and in your positions and and what have you and uh, and of course it's I'm I'm generalizing a lot when I when I say that but then but then uh, within that um, it's um, uh, the individual tools you, that every player has is is important uh, it's not just technically it's it's all it, it also has a lot to do with with your uh, your understanding of the game and, and the, your ability to, to read the game and use the correct tool at the right time, uh, but of course the, the the technical element and and how you bring that in, uh, because yeah, it's probably the the question is asked a little bit is is uh, winning winning a situation uh, depends very much on your an individual player's ability to create space or create angles facing forward or uh, small, small things like that. And um, that's what's fascinating in football because we, 
we we rely on one or two persons or maybe a goalkeeping coach as well to to coach everything like this um uh, so it's um it is important but i don't know it's there's also become a, a little bit of a market in in some countries where you know there's individual coaches that that work on specific techniques that also uh, um, what do you say? Offer their services, which is, uh, of course, it's uh, it's fantastic because they they actually have the time to to really go beneath the surface and and, and uh, find the the small things that can help. So, in terms of, I gi I just give one example. I've coached for a long time, and and uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, ten years ago, I I came um, uh, came across a someone who's a very good friend of mine now, and, and she'd become an expert in, uh, in the technique of striking the ball. And when I saw her working with players and giving feedback and instructions in that technical aspect, I just said to myself, you know what, I've, I've coached players wrong. I've said, I've said the wrong things. I've given the wrong keys. You know, if I, if I would have known this you know, 20 years ago. So of course it's, it's um, uh, again, we're, maybe say that, that it's, uh, there's so much within teaching technique in, in, in every, every technical element. But uh, of course it's, uh, we, we must do it and, and try and, so for therefore you, you always have so many things to learn as a coach. Um, so I need to find, I need to come across someone who's an expert in 1v1 now. So <laughs> who can tell me that I've, I've been coaching wrong <laughs> for 30 years. Yeah. Uh, I'll throw that over to Ali. I'm in, probably in danger of going down a rabbit hole here and keeping you all, all day on this topic, I think. But um, yeah, that idea of technical coaching, um, do you specifically have to show the players the the technique themselves that actually you're drilling that or do you allow them okay this is the challenge of this situation and you allow the players to organize themselves around around that and create that technical ability themselves rather than no actually this is what the textbook says this is how you need to so i i think um i think obviously there's a distinction between technical and tactical i think tactical it very much depends on the setup and what the coach how the coach wants them to play and how the opposition plays and all of that and and then yes you might have to be very sort of prescriptive in terms of you know if we find ourselves in an overload i want you there 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 and that you know that, that that's tactics technical for me so yes if you're teaching someone how to do something so what we call ball manipulation literally how you are making the ball move with your foot that needs to be taught because so a lot of that so we say back in the day people just used to you know kick a ball against a wall and that actually does teach a player a lot of things because if you strike the ball with a certain part of your foot it's going to make the ball move in a certain way and it's going to make the ball come back at you at a certain speed if you kick it forcefully and, and all of that so a player can learn things doing that by themselves, but surely the job of the coach and the experts is to teach them the technique of how you strike the ball, as Anne Helene was saying, how you receive the ball, how do you cushion a ball, how, you know, all of that technique needs to be taught to a player. Um, I think on the, on the 1v1 coaching that Anne Helene touched on, um, I think there is definitely a place for it. And I think I know lots of players that have really improved their technique by having one-to-one -one tuition outside of the football club environment. Um, but I think what's important is that these things don't happen in isolation because the match itself is chaotic. So you can have a brilliant technique. Um, and then the minute you're put under pressure, does that, does, does that technique serve you? Um, and in some cases it will, because you'll have practiced it and practiced it and practiced it, and you'll have also practiced in chaos. So you will have practiced being under pressure and still executing that technique. Um, the other thing with technique, uh, uh, again, that Anne-Helen touched on was um, knowing when to execute that skill. It's one thing to be able to do it. It's one thing to be able to manipulate that ball in that way. But there will be moments in a game where the player has to decide uh, 
if that's the right skill to use in that moment at that time. And that relies on them reading everything around them, which is why we need to get away from coaches and parents screaming from the touchline, because actually that player's not listening to you. They can't hear you because they're having to make, I can't even count the amount of decisions that you have to make at any given moment in football because that picture is constantly changing. So by the time the coach, by the time those words have left the mouth, mouth of the coach or the parent and reached the player's ears, even if they can hear you, the picture's already changed. So our job as a coach fundamentally is to equip the players with the skill and the tools to play the game. Um, but then give them that space and time to work out how to actually play it. Fantastic. I know, uh, I'm in danger then. I was throwing back for Anne-Helene and let you have the, the final word. If there's anything you wanted to add there before, uh, before we wrap up. That's probably good. You know, no, don't disturb the ball holder. <laughs> That's, it's the same thing. It's like uh, make, make someone take their own decisions. That's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the same in life you make someone take their own decisions you're just there to support and to guide and uh, whether it's a 1v1 situation or it's a or it's in life <laughs> perfect Anna Lane Ali thank you very much for joining us this morning thank you thank you so much for having us thank you